Hey everybody, this is Jamstack. Um, this is not about, you know, something to prevent clogged printers or something to eat on toast or a way to make music. Uh, we're here to talk about web application architecture in the uh, <laughs> modern world. But first, let's get to a personal story of mine. If I can get my clicker to work. I want to start with sharing my web application journey uh, so far. I started building web apps in the late 90s with technologies like classic active server pages and SQL Server and other uh, Microsoft stack you know, type things. I built an intranet web app for DuPont so that different manufacturing sites could share documents training, safety information, um, and, uh, you know, a way to collaborate and share things with their employees. Administrators could log in and update content. And I didn't realize it at the time, but basically I ended up creating a content management system or CMS. I found it amusing during this time when uh, mainframe programmers were looking at the internet as it was a you know starting to emerge and you know looking at browsers as the new dumb terminal and at the time i thought they were looking at the internet as a step back you know instead of a step forward now that i'm older i see that they were just recognizing some of the same familiar patterns that they had seen in other you know, waves of technology in their career, and they were just mapping that, you know, information to what they already knew, you know, drawing those analogies so that they could better understand it. Well, 2000 came around and I jumped on the dot-com bandwagon. In my next job, I built another CMS and, um, you know, bigger and better, nicer, new features, and then .NET came along. And what was the first thing I built using ASP.NET? You guessed it, another CMS, bigger and better than the first, than the last. And I continued in this pattern uh, of building content management systems to solve a lot of the applications you know, I was using the same kind of pattern over and over again to build web applications. This every app was a nail and my hammer was the CMS. Well, I got tired of building all these one off CMS apps. So I just as many developers in their have done in their career one time or another, I decided it was time to build a framework. All we need is a good framework. A framework will solve all our problems and help us to go faster. Uh, so, you know, one app to rule them all. So instead of rapidly developing and adding features to one app at a time, I was able to grind several projects to a halt while each waited for my new framework to solve every problem for all time. I got lucky. I pulled it off and I built a pretty awesome application framework in CMS. It, it had features um, I was really proud of, but it was a Frankenstein monster. Uh, it was awful to configure, terrible to maintain, a, a beast to deploy. It's scary to think that there are still some apps out there using my old application framework, as far as I know. This was over in engineering at its finest. Hello, my name is David, and I'm in recovery for building content management systems and unnecessary frameworks. Well, let's walk through an example of a typical web application request. You have a client 
like a desktop or mobile browser, and it wants to access a page on your website or in your web app. And this request goes to your server, and this web server could be any platform uh, running any language like Java, PHP, ASP.NET, Node.js, or a popular CMS like WordPress or Joomla. And the web server figures out what page to render, and, and it probably goes and fetches some data from a relational database that it needs to render that particular view to the client. And the database responds with some data, right? But it's usually not that simple. If you ever open up a query inspection tool like SQL Profiler and witness just how many trips to the database an application makes to generate a single page of content, you would be horrified. But I digress. Moving on, the, the web server gathers all the data it needs and combines the data with a template system of some kind and returns HTML to the client. Every page is built and delivered on demand even if none of the content has changed from request to request. We'll call this pattern the web request walk of shame. All right, great. It's a little messy, uh, but who cares? You know, we, we got the job done. Oh, wait, what's this? Sir, the web requests are coming in too fast. There's too many of them. We can't keep up. Our radar is jammed. Well, yes, great. Now we need to scale. What do we do? One measure of speed is request per second. And let's take for the sake of simplicity that one web page in our app can handle 100 requests per second. Sounds reasonable. Well, what if we need more? Okay, theoretically, if we add another server, we'll get 200 requests per second. But what does that actually mean? Well, it could mean things like we have to add a load balancer and we have to terminate certificates at the balancer. We have to deploy code to multiple servers instead of just one. We have to take one server out of the load balancer upgrade it, switch servers, add the old server back into the load balancer, take the next one out, and so on and, and so forth. So that adds a lot of complexity to the deployments. And then we discover, well, maybe our database has become the bottleneck. Oh no, good grief. So now we got to do things like, we'll just add some caching and wow, by adding some caching, our web, our request per second went to, you know, we can now do 2,000 requests per second. That's amazing. But wait a minute. People are reporting that they are seeing inconsistent results. And how do we make sure that we invalidate the cache when we need to? And it's, well, it's just not as simple as we thought. We keep having these weird performance issues. So we'll just, we'll add some cash over here and we'll add a little bit more cash. It's okay, we got it under control. Oh no, what have we done? And we haven't even talked about security. Building a dynamic server-based application, you have to keep up with all the latest attacks most server-based apps have huge attack surface area. All those endpoints for managing and administering your application are out there for all the hackers to, well, to hack. If you use a CMS, you know, you, plugins could be a security risk or, you know, you, all your admin accounts are out there, uh, all your content, or maybe, you know, just a denial of service attack could bring your whole application down. 
attacks are continuously being becoming more sophisticated and are ever evolving. Using a popular framework or CMS might mean you get better support for mitigating or fixing those those issues or known exploits, but it also could mean that you're at more risk because there's more attackers attacking and finding exploits in those most popular frameworks. I used to run a shared hosting service using servers that I bought and maintained and managed. And I've seen firsthand some of the crazy things that can be that can compromise a website or even an entire server. Today, the expectations of visitors to web applications uh, aren't too demanding, right? They only want your app to be modern and beautiful, interactive, um, dynamic, be real time with supporting messaging and videos and have seamless transitions between pages and be mobile first. You know, kind of standard fare for trying to build a web app these days. And then there are so many ways of measuring performance. Time to first bite, time to first paint, time to first meaningful paint, page load, time to interact, time to last bite, bounce rate, request per second, throughput, error rate, conversions that lead from customer, uh, you know, visitor to customer. <sighs> wow, what we need are more acronyms in technology, don't you think? So why do we have all these ways of measuring performance? Because performance matters. Seconds count. A single second more could mean your visitors give up and you lose potential customers. There are there have been countless studies um, on the effects of performance on signups and conversions and revenue. For example, Pinterest increased search engine traffic and signups by 15% when they reduced their wait times by 40%. Um, Cook increased conversions by 7% when they reduced average page load by just 850 milliseconds. The BBC saw that they lost an additional 10% of users for every additional second their site took to load. And then DoubleClick found through their tracking systems, 53% of mobile visitors abandon a site if a page took more than three seconds to load. Performance matters. In the last five years, we've seen some amazing emerging trends in web technology. More than ever before, it's possible to build rich, powerful, responsive, dynamic web apps without ever touching a single server. There's, you know, no traditional hosting, no servers to provision, no virtual machines, no servers to maintain. We, we don't even have to use things like Docker or containers or Kubernetes if we, if we don't want to. We can do things like open up a terminal and type git push and then like magic, you have an industry leading, fast, scalable, globally distributed, secure, highly available, agile, lean, fault tolerant, flexible, decoupled, world-class, interactive, personalized, dynamic, mobile-first, progressive, disruptive, real-time, seamlessly integrated digital transformation with analytics, AI, and machine learning. Did I miss any buzzwords? What a time to be alive. Jamstack is nothing new. Netlify, a popular content delivery network or CDN, coined the name Jamstack, but Jamstack is not a particular technology or vendor. 
in some ways, you may already have parts of the Jamstack in, well, your stack. Jamstack is a label, um, kind of like Web 2.0. You remember Web 2.0 and the rise of Ajax? Jamstack is a set of emerging trends for building modern web applications. And these trends include Git workflows, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, static site generators, front end frameworks, APIs, which could be also third party APIs, um, things like serverless, um, GraphQL, CDNs. There, there's lots of technologies that, that kind of can be considered part of Jamstack. So Jamstack, the jam, pump pump the jam. Uh, okay, no more old school stuff. The jam in Jamstack stands for JavaScript, APIs, and markup. Although JavaScript is the primary language of the browser for making front end, the front end more dynamic, you can choose whatever language you wish for things like templating and building assets, automating your deployments, creating backend APIs and so forth. Well, in that web request walk of shame that we talked about, caching is pretty awesome when it works. It can short circuit a request and return the exact results that have been asked for. A cache can be introduced at lots of different levels uh, from the database on up. And the goal of a cache is to reduce compute cycles. There's less work for the database or the server. There's less latency. There's fewer network calls. You know, so when you make a request, if you can short circuit that request and just give the results to the client, you've saved a whole lot uh, in that, that, that request lifecycle. Okay. Let me send, give this to you. Do you know what the best cache hit is? The absolute fastest web request a server can serve is a request for a static file. You read a file from a disk and you send it. There's no calls to other APIs no databases to query, no templates to execute. Anything more than a static file requires CPU cycles to execute code and generate a response. A static file wins every time over code. Ah, the heart of Jamstack, the number one goal is to maximize pre-built markup and assets. All the other technologies and practices considered to be part of Jamstack come down to how can we make the workflow better, faster, more automated? How can we maximize the amount of the, of, of the application that we can make static? And how can we push those static assets to the edge, closer to customers, where they are physically located. The edge that I'm talking about is, is you know, using content delivery networks. CDNs are extremely powerful. CDNs have become cheaper, and in some cases, completely free, smarter with regards to uh, atomic deployments and cache invalidation. They reduce latency, being physically closer to the clients, and CDNs are the experts when it comes to scaling to meet demands and traffic, as well as restraining hackers, uh, denial of service attacks. Well, unfortunately, st static, when we think of the word static, we we have, it's kind of a, a bad connotation, right? It's kind of a bad, <laughs> seems like a bad word. We want we want things to be dynamic. We want things to be uh, you know tailored to a particular customer or request. 
So in the modern world of web development, static is today means anything but static. Static is pre-compiled HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, and any other content that can be delivered without having to use compute resources or, you know, ideally a CDN. Once it reaches the client, the app, meaning the, the front end code, can be as personalized and dynamic as anything that you can imagine. The shift in thinking is moving more of the runtime from the web server to the browser. The design of a Jamstack application is kind of like a native mobile app when you think about it. So in a native mobile application, you have pre-built, you know, components as much as possible. Everything is baked into the application. When you download an application, it includes all the assets that it needs, like the images and, uh, you know, code or JavaScript or, you know, other ways of rendering things. When needed, it connects to other APIs uh, to, you know, which could be your APIs or third-party APIs. It's designed to load really fast and it's designed to be super interactive, um, you know, and very fluid. Kind of like Jamstack. Jamstack is, is trying to accomplish these same kind of things, but, you know, using the browser. Okay, remember our web request walk of shame. Let's come back to that again. Now, in comparison, I want to give you the Jamstack request to glory. You ready? We have our client, such as a desktop or mobile browser. It makes a request for a resource, such as a web page. The request is routed to the nearest server in a content delivery network and the CDN. Now get this, you won't believe what happens next. It serves the file back to the client. Drop the mic. There is nothing, nothing faster. You have achieved ludicrous speed. Okay, so <laughs> how do we get there? In light of the information that I've given you so far, what if I told you that you need to stop writing silly server-side code, Java, .NET, PHP, Node.js, or whatever server-side language or framework you use, and instead focus on building static assets? Yeah, sounds disgusting, right? I get it. That was my reaction too. I'm not going to give up my favorite platform, my favorite language or frameworks. Well, I submit to you that there's no code faster than no code. Eh? Think about it. And there's no code that's more secure than no code. Am I right? If your application is made up of static assets, a huge portion of your application's attack surface area simply disappears. Now, before you completely dismiss everything that I'm saying and get, give me a few more minutes of your time and, you know, try to keep an open mind. All is not lost. You can still use your favorite platforms and languages, just perhaps in new and more focused ways. A typical Jamstack application architecture and workflow might look like the following. You may have a Git repository where you have your front end UI and some content and templates used to render those static assets. You might have what's called a headless CMS. Uh, designed for Jamstack, where you maintain your content. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. 
Um, and you may have one or more third party APIs or APIs that you have created internally to make, to add more features to your app. When you make a change to any of these things, a webhook or some other type of event triggers your build process to build your application. And when the build process kicks off, it takes all that markup and templates and your repository, and it starts compiling the assets for your application. Well, during the build process, it might reach out to your CMS or other APIs, your database, and for additional content and data to compile into the rendered content. As much as possible, the final output will be like a snapshot of everything that makes up your application. Your pre-compiled assets are then deployed, ideally to a CDN, and when a page is requested, the static content is delivered and rendered as quickly as technically possible. Your application might then use JavaScript to progressively enhance the application experience using your APIs or third-party APIs. One of the many benefits of using a CDN is atomic deployments. This means that each new build of your application is deployed through the CDN and like the flipping of a switch, it happens all at once like a transaction. Your users won't see inconsistent results this also means that if you need to, rolling back to a previous version of your app, it becomes rather trivial, and you can do that with confidence. You can use branches in your Git workflow to deploy different environments for testing and for previewing. <clears throat> Static site generators have been dismissed as being only good for documentation. But today, there are amazing generators for every language and platform. If your front-end team loves React, then they might like Gatsby or Next.js. If Vue is your thing, take a look at Nuxt. If you want the fastest builds possible, try something like Hugo or Eleventy. Eleventy also supports lots and lots of template engines and it's extremely flexible. I've personally been using Eleventy on some of my projects and I, I think it's fantastic. You can also use good old Jekyll, which is the generator that kind of started all of this. In recent years, we've seen an explosion of great API platforms and the market is just going to continue to grow. You can progressively add features to your Jamstack application from the best APIs available, such as Algolia for search and Stripe for e-commerce and payments. Use Okta for authentication, Twilio for messaging. Fauna is an exciting modern database with native GraphQL support. Why would you dare build a system for sending text messages or emails when you could leverage an expert like Twilio and SendGrid? Why would you build an entire payment system from scratch when you can use something like Stripe? Why build authentication when you could use something like Okta? Login, authentication, user profile management, Identity, multi-factor authentication, secure content, personalization. Okay, full disclosure, I work for Okta. But a company like this, you know, why would you not want to leverage the experts in using, building these kind of features into your application? The, these, these APIs, that are available are the experts. They are far more vested in being the very best at what they do um, than you could ever do on, on your own, in your own implementation. Plus, 
your attack surface area is minimized. These third-party party APIs carry the burden of securing and scaling their own infrastructure. They know a thing or two, thing or two because they've seen a thing or two. And now would be a good time to, you know, if you absolutely need to build your own APIs, to consider something like functions as a service, like AWS Lambdas, or Azure Functions, or Google Functions, or Netlify Functions. Functions as a service automatically scale to meet demand and you pay for only what you use, much like a, a CDN. Taking the Jamstack approach to decouple your front end, JavaScript, APIs, markup, and create a predictable and confidence building continuous integration deployment process, leveraging those, those third party APIs where that makes sense, your dev teams are free to focus intensely on building features instead of maintaining a monolithic app or CMS, or managing infrastructure, fighting complexity, and a multitude of challenges that rise from building server-side applications. There are a lot of challenges to be made, you know, choices to be made uh, on designing a Jamstack application that fits your needs, but the overall architecture is incredibly liberating. Backend developers can actually focus on building APIs and services. Front-end developers can focus on the design and the experience. How much time and effort do your web teams spend building and managing infrastructure, deployments, database migrations, monitoring, provisioning, servers and networks, load balancers, caching, just copying files over, around, you, are you still using FTP? Uh, managing secrets, config files, keeping environments updated, backups and logging. Managing infrastructure versus building real features that bring value to your customers. You know, the more that you can take off of that burden away from your developers, the, the better so that they can really focus on building features that provide value. Uh, since becoming a fan of the Jamstack approach, I've speculated on what my past projects would have been like if I had had access to the same technologies that we have today. Knowing what I know now, what would I do different? Well, around 2011, I joined a startup where we were building um, a content management type system. It was a social network system for white labeled um, media galleries and, and so forth for TV news stations and newspaper and radio. And a lot of the content that we were, that was focused on weather related events like storms and tornadoes and snow floods and other major events in that in that media's community. And the vast majority of our traffic for this application came from folks just browsing and searching the media galleries. Serving that content was very much like that web request walk of shame we talked about. We tried modern technology for the day, such as NoSQL content databases to minimize the number of round trips between the browser and the database. And our servers were co-located in a data center roughly in the middle of the US so that our customers on either coast would have equally terrible experiences. And we gave us, what gave us the most heartburn were big spikes in traffic, which was usually tied to some catastrophic weather event. So those spikes in demand were as unpredictable as, well, the weather. A big storm would come along and through one of our customers area and we'd end up staying up all day and all night doing whatever we could to make sure that the system stayed up and responsive, including adding more servers. In light of what I know about Jamstack today, what would I have done differently 
if I were to build this system all over again? Well, I would make I would make sure that everything, pretty much everything that was served that people could view could have been static, a series of static web pages. You know, we could have created a, a process where we build all of those static pages and then push them to a CDN. And, you know, at that point, the really the only thing that would be um, using our APIs and our servers for like compute resources would be when someone needed to upload a, a piece of media, you know, and, and taking that and ingesting it and then using the system that we had built to, to generate like all the thumbnails and previews and all that kind of stuff, which would trigger the build process and start all, you know, the builds all over again and produce those static assets. Man, it would have been so nice not to have those kinds of, you know, stressful moments when we were having to watch our servers all the time. All right, so not everyone who contributes to an application are developers. You have probably content creators, technical writers, marketing people, and other contributors who are more comfortable using a content management system. Well, there's a whole new market of CMS tools that have emerged that fit perfectly with Jamstack. These content tools are decoupled from the presentation of that content your content creators can manage content separately from the website itself. These headless CMSs fall under two major categories. There's Git-based, which uh, are things like Netlify CMS or Forestry or Tina CMS. And these generally um, generate markdown and transparently behind the scenes commit changes to the same Git repository where the application project lives. So every time, you know, a content creator or marketing person or whoever is generating content saves a page, saves some content, it gets pushed to your Git repository and which can kick off a, a build process, either for staging or, or whatever your uh, cycle may look like. And then there's API-based uh, CMSs. And these can be things like con Contentful, Sanity, Ghost, Strappy, uh, Graph CMS. So these are designed so that during your build process, the build tool uh, fetches all the content from the CMS API and uses it to generate all the markup. So whether you're using a Git-based or API-based CMS, any update created by the CMS will trigger your build process and for the appropriate environment and staging or production based on your workflow. So the obvious question is, where do I get started? Well, here's an overused quote to help motivate you, right? Well, go to my list of resources. I've included some getting started tutorials covering specific technologies. I've also included a new tutorial that uh, I've shown you how I built and deployed a serverless functions uh, with Netlify CMS. Um, choose a static site generator. Staticgen.com can help you, which you know is also in the list of my resources. Most static site generators have great getting started tutorials, including how to easily deploy them to a CDN. And uh, if you need to, you might introduce a headless CMS. Uh, headlesscms.org can help you to identify some different tools that you can try. And again, that link is also in my list of resources. What I hope is that, you know, maybe, maybe you're like me when you first heard me talk about static site generators and, you know, creating static files and, and all this kind of stuff. You might have been like, that sounds terrible. Uh, you can't get rid of server-side code. Well, I hope this talk has got your wheels turning. And maybe if you really think about it, you might realize, hmm, 
you know, this Jamstack idea just might work. I've been thinking a lot about the large scale applications that I've worked on uh, and, you know, brought to market in the past. And in hindsight, I can see that if we had taken this approach, man, there is so much headache and, you know, simplification and so much more we could have done with the, the resources that we had. One last thing, I believe those of us in technology have an incredible opportunity to impact our workplaces, our families, our community, and the entire world in positive and meaningful ways through, through the amazing things that we can do with technology. I hope that you take this information that I've given you, along with the other things that you're learning through in this, in this event, and you get out there and you be awesome. Thank you very much. Until next time, when perhaps we will see each other at an all things open in person soon. All right, thank you, David. And thank you all for attending. I see one question in the Q&A there, David. And uh, okay. if you wanna answer that, feel free to. All right, I'll just go through the the chat and and look for for anything. Was the question in the chat or was it in the Q&A? There's one in the, the Q&A. I'm sorry, you say that again? There's there's one in the Q&A. Okay. It looks Some like they just I'm, followed up with it too. Some reason I'm not seeing the Q&A, I'm just seeing the chat. Okay, I'll read what it says. It says, why do you count based on the web page is the web page relevant to the load and then follow up with meant by that the web page is already rendered the request will be handled by the server um well the, if i if i understand the question correctly the goal is uh if you're delivering static content say html css and javascript it's it's done in such a way that the the page the the initial experience renders extremely fast. And so whoever's visiting that web page can see all the, the regular content almost instantaneously, uh, at least perceptively, that's that's the goal is for someone to see a web page almost as soon as they click on that link or, or wherever they need to go. And then um, if there's anything that's, that's uh, personalized for that particular visitor, um, you could progressively add that information to the page through your JavaScript and, and APIs.